hidden for that. I guess. Everything can finally come to together. So, <laughs> yeah. so and for a brief introduction, uh, hopefully this will be very fast. Uh, after, uh, so, so if you if you know some biology friend, and, they, and there's a common saying. Uh, in fact, one of my advisors say. Joked, uh, he chose biology because he doesn't have to learn advanced calculus <laughs> when he was an undergrad. And that's unfortunately is a case uh, now, but actually that wasn't the case long, long time ago. In fact, uh, it's really the physicist, and this is the Schrodinger who got Nobel Prize, and fascinated about what life is. And this is Clark Shannon, who is the uh, pioneer in information theory. They actually all uh, considered study what life is and what life should be coded in a way. In fact, uh, the word genetic code is, is studied by some mathematician. Shannon actually proposed biology code should be a very, a very large number and then somehow uh, decompose into a small number of in information. So, so what is life? And that's actually the title of Schrodinger's book. And life is basically a manifestation of quadratic code. In, in, in some way, uh, life is all about just four outcomes in one position, A, T, C, G. And that four-bit code has to be manifest in certain, in, in certain way. And in, in a way, if you can picture us, we are basically the hardware for a quaternary code. And in fact, some biologists even argue the most important thing in life is basically that genetic code, and we are just a vehicle to carry that code to execute it. And the, in, in a way, we can view life is just manifestation of quadratic code. From that perspective, computer science and biology are really the same discipline. So, okay, that's so uh, kind of a little stretch. But uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention Watson and Crick here. So Watson Crick. Uh, uh, Watson was 28 years old when, when he actually tried to study the genetic code. It is because at the, the time, uh, you look at biology, this continuous uh, living things. Most of biology at that time doesn't like the word code because a code by definition means it's a discrete. It's hard to imagine a discrete system actually determining how life is. So, so it's, most people actually doesn't like the theory there is a code for life. But Watson, as a 20 years old, who thinks he should do something new, and he read Schrodinger's book, and he thinks there should be a genetic code. That's actually a motivation for Watson, he actually to look for DNA as a genetic code. And DNA is a binary, uh, sorry, quadratic code. Right? So just ATC. That's actually turned out to be a, a, a very happy ending, I guess, for Watson. <laughs> it's not some fluke thing he's chasing, I guess. Okay, so, but in a way, life is basically like this. If you read a computer code, it's actually just binary, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. But somehow it makes sense in the end. And this is basically how the code of life is going to look like. The top is one line of code, the bottom is another line of code. Can we tell the difference between the two? There's actually a very important difference between these two codes. Uh, at the top, that's a normal gene called a mismatch repair gene. At the bottom is a gene with a, a slightly just change of two, uh, two codes, leads to one change of triplet. And that's a that tiny little change leads to a mutant copy of this gene, and that's a major cause of colon cancer. So, and in, the, in this case, we know this because we can uh, uh, sequence the gene of the patient. We know the patient who has this gene had the colon cancer. And we can also put this gene into some model organism, like a saccharomyces cerevis, which is a small yeast cell. We can actually see how this gene behavior. So this takes a lot of time to actually for us to understand how this code works. Now, and the whole work in biology, basically trying to understand how this code in, in the end can lead to life as we are. That's so, so oh, sorry, I shouldn't point to my computer. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, this code, ATCG, is a DNA. That's our genetic code. And 
it's going to pack into a chromosome, and this chromosome is in every cell we have. And that's how most of cellular life on the planet are. Uh, in fact, from viruses, it also has its own genome, although viruses have to live off our cellular organism. And, and we often call this uh, genome type or genetic makeup. And the way we all different is in part due to the, uh, our difference in genetic makeup. And all, all those genotypes eventually will be manifest as phenotype. And basically what we can see is what we call phenotype. And everyone looks different. Right, so that's, that's the uh, display some trait that's what we call uh, phenotype. Now, those phenotypes may be something we want or maybe something we don't want. This including, like, we, we, we eventually going to change from youth all the way to here at the aging process. That's also a phenotype. We may don't like it, but that's just how we behave. <laughs> and, and in this case, that's a cancer patient, a, a, a little child pediatrician, a, 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 ch a child cancer patient. So that's also a, a phenotypic display of the genetic code running in that particular system. So the biology in a way is basically trying to understand why the genotype eventually leads to different phenotypes. It could be a, a, a phenotype we want, or it could be a phenotype we don't want. But can we actually do something on it? So the, the whole enterprise of biology, all this biomedical research, is trying to understand why this different genotype among us leads to different phenotypes. That's the whole business. And, but usually from genotype to predict phenotype is not that straightforward un un unless it is very uh, clear uh, Mendelian case or simple gene case. But most of the biology is really trying to go from phenotype to genotype. Then most of the biology basically look at the different phenotype and then try to uh, make a mutation to the cell or iso and study, compare the wild type with the mutant and find out which part of the two systems are different, trying to understand how those different genes, genotypic difference behave, the uh, normal cell and unhealthy cell, find out the, the, the genotypic difference. And, but nowadays, uh, we have a lot of a, a method to actually identify the genotype. This is the major technology breakthrough is really in, uh, one of them is here. We can easily sequence uh, everybody's genome. And we can also have a lot of high throughput method to measure different genotypes, a uh, different phenotype. Like every, every time uh, you, you do an annual physical check, you take, I guess, two vials of blood and run a lot of a test. So, it, it, in, in a way, we have a lot of high throughput method to identify both genotype and phenotype. That's the major breakthrough compared to maybe even a decade ago. There is a large amount of uh, sequence data and of phenotypic data. That's the main, main uh, driving force uh, for this uh, new medicine, which I'm, I, I'm trying to elude uh, here. So, Here's a, a development of sequencing technology. And 1953, that's uh, Watson and Craig first proposed DNA uh, structure. But 10 years later, one of the tRNA would actually sequence. And that's one, almost 25 years later, people, uh, a Sanger found out a, a, a simple, efficient way to sequence DNA. And later on, polymerase chain reaction was uh, uh, invented. By the way, I, I, this got Nobel Prize, this got Nobel Prize, this got Nobel Prize. Uh, the rest of them haven't got it. They, they are all revolutionary technologies. <laughs> so, and the first automatic DNA sequencer uh, is based on fluorescence technology. And it, so up, after 40 years, 
the human genome project was proposed. And people, well, to sequence a single gene and sequence a whole genome require actually a different mentality. And people propose something called whole genome shotgun method. That's actually uh, not entirely uh, new in hardware, it, but it's, it's a new, uh, I guess, research strategy. So with this whole genome uh, shotgun and automatic sequencing, the first human genome project is officially concluded uh, uh, with, uh, in about uh, 15, 13 years, something. And in the early uh, 21st century, then people started something called next generation sequencing. <coughs> in, in, uh, compared to the automatic uh, sequencer, this next generation sequencer is almost a hundredfold faster. And by the, so this directly leads to the something called personal genome, uh, personalized medicine uh, project. And the first person, personal genome sequence is actually Watson himself, and the cost is estimated about $1 million. So that's uh, James Watson's genome. But seven years later, we can sequence anyone's genome with a cost of about $1,000 right now. That's exactly two years ago. Right now, it should be even less than that. The actual cost is only about uh, 600 to 700. And so in 2016, uh, the previous President Obama and uh, started Precision Medicine and Cancer Moonshot project. The, the Cancer Moonshot was actually personally, was, was a term coined by the uh, Biden whose son died of cancer. So, okay, that's pretty much summarized where is a snapshot of the sequencing technology and why we come to this stage today. And so what is this precision medicine? Uh, in fact, this concept is not really new. And if, we, if I don't want to get my own glasses, I have to uh, first go through some very complicated measure and get a prescription for my own glasses. This is basically personalized. If it's not personalized, basically we have to take an average of everybody's eye and then give it that average glasses. Probably that won't work for anyone, but that's what a non-personalized medicine will become. And you will think that's kind of ridiculous. We will do that something like this. And unfortunately, that actually is happening every day. Uh, in fact, I even bring a bottle of uh, thank you. That's actually time and all. <laughs> There's a prescription here. How much you should take? And, but that's actually based on something called average person. And that average, average person doesn't even exist. Everybody is a little different. It's special, I guess, as we commonly say. So that's actually the medicine we are today. And the precision medicine basically should be working some, something like that. Basically, if I want to take medicine based on my own genetic makeup, I should know how, like, What's the dose? What kind of medicine I should take? That's basically what this personalized medicine should become. <coughs> basically, for everybody's genome, if we, we should know the dose and or maybe even alternative medicine. That's basically what this personalized medicine uh, 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 go. And the whole paradigm of personalized medicine basically, based on biology, you have the insight and use technology to get the new data using computational to understand this process. It's basically this paradigm uh, of the so prediction medicine of system biology. And a network analysis is actually at the heart of this so called. Um, human will have 20,000 genes, and those genes will interact with each other. And every gene has a slightly different between a different individual. So the complexity really goes from uh, uh, genomes to gene interactions, from gene interactions to cell to cell interaction, from cell to cell interaction into physio physiological differences. That's the whole uh, multi scale modeling process of this precision medicine uh, plan. Now, I, I'm going to uh, just list two challenges what I want to tackle uh, for precision medicine. One is something called emergent problem. Emergent population is something uh, like a system. The system has a property, but for every component, you don't see that component has this property. 
Okay. For example, you, you buy a bicycle and it comes out in a box. Now, pretty not bicycle, it cannot ride on that box. That will put all the components together, then you can become a rideable bicycle. So, the function of the bicycle is really the emergent software of every component. Unless you put all the components, they configure in the right way, that bicycle function is not suddenly going to exist. That's what the emergent software basically is. So, and this other challenge is how to predict based on genome type. Okay, so the, the unfortunately, the emergent public is something uh, is still a debatable concept. It's something when you see it, you know it. We know the termite castle is one school of fish um, function of molecule because function of molecule that individual uh, residue, but those residues doesn't actually behave like standards. And some people even uh, argue the color, the color usually is occur when 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 they interact on islands or not by at the one frequency, they emit it at another frequency, not clear the line. Okay, so but I'm going to first address the first problem, the emerging problem, emerging property problem, giving one example, and that's then this example is not about time. Uh, so here's the interesting one. What do you think this is? The emerging property I'm going to talk about. And I, I'm also going to tell you what he shall do with a Boeing airplane do with and computer do it. And then I also tell you virus actually doesn't have this property, so radioactive acid for them. That's basically it's aging <laughs> So all right, so uh, oh, uh, what well, uh, I'm actually going to uh, 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 explain that in the next few slides. Uh, East aging I actually uh, is a, a did I jump in? Oh, okay, I think I think I missed a the, the slide. So aging in East is really a uh, uh, aging actually in human is also a stochastic process because when you look at identical twins, they never have exactly the same age. One of them, in fact, if you like a uh, hundred identical twins. Maybe 20 to 30 of them lead to the same thing. That's actually a common in almost every species we have that. So the lifespan in those the species, only 20 to 30 percent are determined by genome. And oh, I, I missed another another uh, word here. <laughs> but almost every gene actually can influence lifespan. Right? So if if if, if uh, if you, uh, if people eat unhealthy, smoking, and there will, there will be a risk for shortening lifespan. So, so, but there are also universal characteristics, and I'm actually uh, going to explain that later. So, I propose aging actually is an emerging property of networks, but since I'm going to only focus on cell, I say cellular aging is an emerging property of gene networks. That's the whole idea. But the way that, why I uh, say aging in the emerging public is actually based on quantitative definition. It's basically I'm going to quantify viability decline over time normalized by viability. By the, that's basically how high the It first used by uh, Benjamin Gumpers almost 250 years ago. And that's the definition. It's, it's, what this definition means is the if this one is a constant, this mortality really is a constant, and then the viability becomes an exponential decay like radioactive isotope. A radioactive, radioactive isotope will really sound like uh, exponential, but we don't say radioactive, radioactive isotope A. We basically say decay. It's because the channel <coughs> of dying is constant over time, right? So if, if a baby at home, uh, at the age of zero, the same chance of pass away as the 80 years old. Then we are not 80. Right? We, from age to zero to 80, we have the same chance of passing away. Then we are not 80 at all. Right? So that would be a non aging system. But unfortunately, that's not us, that's virus. <laughs> but, but virus actually is at the same chance of dying at age zero compared to, say, 60 days. So, 
uh, a virus actually doesn't age. Uh, I have a theory to explain that, uh, show later on. And I use actually something called psychometric therapy to study aging. It's one, one of my major model, uh, models. So, a psychometric therapy is basically the same cell, uh, same E cell we use to make a bread, bread wine, and uh, beer. In fact, in that therapy, it's uh, in Spanish beer. That's where it comes from. <laughs> it's a Latin word. And the, the yeast actually can, can divide many times. We call it a replicative lifespan. And it also has another lifespan, basically, the whole lung is maintained by ability. That's like a calendar time. And in experiment, and this is, uh, I actually did this experiment myself for more than uh, well, 11 years ago. So, working almost 20 hours a day trying to do this thing. <laughs> so, and the microscope, you just count how many kind of cells divide. I thought in this one, the E cell divided one, two, three, four, five, six. So, this E cell there for six generations. And then we do this for 100 cells and count. The 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 the, the half, half the cell by the way that's the biology program fit with the comfort primate model. So that's how yeast lifespan can be measured and fit with comfort model. Um, uh, so the this this uh, R zero basically means when T is zero, that's the initial mortality rate. But this T coefficient for the comfort model is actually Describe how the mortality rate increases over time. Basically, how fast the chance of dying will increase over time. So that's actually a rate of aging basis. Um, but nowadays, uh, we actually don't measure these cells in a TD way. We actually have a automatic way to do this. So this is actually one of my collaborator who generated a chip measure for high throughput lifetime measure. And they basically flow into a cell into a chip and they automatically measure this using a time lapse image system. We can just track the cell into the, the trap and measure how many times the cell divide. And this is work on uh, micro collaborations. And in the end, we basically have these time lapse images with cell traffic between the, the, the traps. And then we, uh, we, we, we basically have hundreds, thousands of images. And then the, so the task becomes a computational image analysis of instead of a, a manual kind of counting problem. Okay, so this is uh, a high throughput image analysis project uh, actually I need to get it done. And there's all, the, the lab, there's also accumulation of lab, large amount of large and major data for yeast. And this again to my other collaborator. So they, this Two lab literally measured the lifespan <laughs> for 4,500 uh, single gene deletion for, for, for the yeast cell. So to, for the single yeast cell, there are about uh, 5,500 genes, and about a thousand of them are essential. We cannot remove them. But the remaining 45,000 for every gene, we can measure its lifespan effect. So this experiment is done, and it's already there. And we, if we look at it, this actually, uh, I'm going to jump. It basically measure how genotypic different inference lifespan. And in yeast, actually, it's 20, 24%. And that's actually the measurement in every species. So in human identical twin study, it's also 20% uh, inference on lifespan. And now here's the universal uh, characteristic of AD. So when we use the two comforts, uh, when we use the two parameter comforts model measure aging, there's actually a linear correlation between the two parameters. That's the same observation in human, which is called strapper model and correlation uh, back uh, oh, almost 80 years ago, no, 60 years ago. So what, what this means, aging, even though like human will live maybe I mean, 75, but yeast live only for three days in a row. And mouse live for maybe 12 years. And turtle may live 100, 150 years. But all those different species, they, they actually all follow this rule, the same linear, decade linear correlation between the comfort parameters. What this means is like the 
But for example, here I I, I uh, if I throw a coin, right, it can be head or tail. This is basically a binomial distribution, right? But if I throw a dice, it's it's one of six outcome. But both both process, even though they look quite different, they they are both multinomial distribution. Right, that's, so, so even though different species, I mean, the human, our lifespan basically dies through between zero to 75 plus some 50% now. Our, our lifespan dies seem to be much longer than uh, bacteria cell. But the, the characteristic is the same, which basically means they are same basic principle behind this random process. That's basically what I'm trying. I throw a coin. I throw a, a, a six outcome dice, or I can throw a 20 outcome dice. In human, we can throw, a, say, 75 outcome dice to determine what your lifespan is. That's basically the same random process behind it. That's basically what I'm trying to argue. So how to explain this is, is suggesting a common principle behind this process of aging. And the way I come out is, is by proposing this emerging process of gene network. And the way this actually is not a, a it's not a completely new uh, concept. It's actually a concept already studied in engineering for a long time. And these two persons apply this engineering cross uh, uh, theory to biology. So basically, if it's one light in this room and it's exponential, then in this room, uh, the light goes out in constant. But if I have two light in this room, the chance of this room to start at the time zero is twice lower. But as long as, as soon as one of the light goes off, the chance of this room to start will be double. But, but since this is a random process over time, the chance of this room to start will always increase to that one light probability. So by, I, I'm not doing any actual analysis. I can tell simply by building more redundancy in the system, the system going to age over time. That's basically the main idea behind this model. So, so but uh, in engineering, we, we do this redundancy by just add some more things, right? But in biology, we actually did it do it that way. <laughs> so, so in engineering, you can, the, the more reliability, the more component you have, the more reliable you have. If, if, if you have a single family at home, you use a generator for electricity. You are afraid of uh, you know wind time or so just put two generators. Be more reliable for three, for small, it will be <laughs> more reliable. But that's why I cannot how our life is built. We actually have a very complex gene network for this kind of reliability. So and the way I create model aging, one of the key phenotypes is actually is cell death. And I need to rush my time side. That could be on time. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but to model aging, I feel I use something called essential gene and non-essential gene. When, when the uh, e gene interaction over time will be lost over time, when all the e uh, interaction of the essential, essential gene are lost, that's a deletion of the essential gene. And by definition, the, a gene is essential because when it's removed, the cell will die. So that basically is a dead cell. And that's why I go to model aging. And mathematically, this network model and this traditional reliability engineering model are the, are the same. So I basically apply this engineering model into the gene network model by, by this conver uh, con conversion. So, okay, so then I have built a network model. But unfortunately, this is something called viable model of aging. In order to build the uh, biological aging, I needed this exponential part, not the power law part. And it turns out the main difference between machine aging and biological aging is really the difference. Right? Everybody is different, but every Apple laptop when they build, they are the same. They are particularly built for the same for efficiency and economy. Right? So every everything come on this machine assembly line, they are all identical. So basically, the main difference is machine is a homogeneous system, biological system are people in. That's the main difference. And you point out all I have to do is to introduce stochastic stochastic noise into my network model, and then I have the biological aging. So, uh, 
So modular lab uh, gene network with stochastic noise actually it, it leads to biological gain. So and then I actually can regenerate this uh, uh, negative correlation between the two gamma parameters. So my model actually can predict uh, the well-known characteristic of aging model. So uh, any model has to generate the known prediction, otherwise it shouldn't even stand. Okay, so and then I apply this model, try to uh, explain something called uh, a calorie restriction or dietary restriction on my side. And it turns out uh, the most effective way to live a long, healthy life is just to eat about 20% less, 10 to 20% less. And this is actually effectively uh, except lifespan in bacteria, yeast cell, uh, Drosophila, mouse, chimpanzee, and human. The, the, so the most effective way to live a long, healthy life is actually just to eat 10 to 20 percent. But why not the case? I'm arguing because with all those pathways, it's just going to lead to more reliable gene interaction. With more reliable gene interaction, it has more longer cellular life and I mean better physiology. That's basically my argument. And this actually my whole uh, NSF career was based upon. And, but biological network is actually much more complex than just simple uh, uh, engineering network. It actually has a lot of technical demand, including like power law. Uh, this actually a uh, this is power law configuration. And so it will be much easier to use a simulation based. Uh, I, I can't study the aging of any network instead of that I propose a mathematical model. So the way uh, to do it by doing simulation. And basically, that's actually a, a simulate. So, uh, it turns out this is an a, a algorithm for something called maximal and minimal algorithm. And I can use a metric way to actually simulate a lifespan. And based on this model, I can also predict some of the uh, uh, theoretical property of genes, including something called the synthetic lethal gene. But, but the time going to even on this. Uh, okay, so here's chapter two. When engineering is medicine. So uh, basically the second challenge of uh, precision medicine is they say, how can we predict? How can we if you say this drug is war, how can we know this drug is war? Right, so that's basically the whole challenge of this. And it turns out this basically is an engineering perspective, right? So you have a cell in a healthy state and cell in an unhealthy state. And we somehow try to use either a drug intervention or a gene therapy, change that back into the healthy state. And so basically, if that's an unhealthy state and we want the cell somehow goes back to the healthy state and stay there, and doesn't go back. Right? So this basically is a control problem. That's basically is controllability in system biology or engineering. And this is well studied in engineering. I actually have to read this undergrad textbook to actually familiar myself with the basic control theory to start with this. Right. So, well, this actually in engineering, this is uh, first proposed by Kama in 1960, that three or seven. Anyhow, but this is well studied for linear time invariant system. As long as the, uh, the controllability uh, metric is full rack, you have a full control system. This actually is well documented, even in an undergrad textbook. Right. So this basically, uh, controllability for being a time variant system is well understood. But biology is much more complex than a single system. How can we even study the complex natural control? Right. So that's the challenge. It turns out one way to do this is also proposed by someone in the 1970s. That's something called structural controllability. So if we can, and the, so your structural uh, controllability thing say we don't have to study a system in a fully controlled, as long as on average, that's, that system can be controlled using a structural uh, uh, controllability, and that's a controllable system. That actually is also. Uh, 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 very, very well understood uh, method. It turns out to apply this structural controllability in complex gene network is also become a graph 
matching an algorithm. So basically, this complex gene network control problem is become a computational algorithm problem just to matching graph edge and node. And this this is really a simple but beautiful theory and uh, discovered by these authors, uh, Dr. Liu, now at Harvard, and Barabasi. And I'm not actually on this, don't know this person, but the other two person have been drafted. So that's how the complex gene network can be analyzed now. That's the, actually this is published in 2011. Now, and we can apply this controllability theory to human gene network and just to see how the controllability can study human disease. It turns out that, uh, what's the main? It turns out uh, the most interactive gene just cannot be a, a driver. So in a control network, you have a driver node, you have the, uh, I guess, I have a lot of terms, right? Like if, if you have a four wheel drive, you your car will be more controlled. If you have a two-wheel drive, your car will be less controlled. But what, what kind of uh, genes should be driver in a, in a gene network? And it turns out those driver nodes can never be the genes who interact with many genes. They have to be the genes who interact with fewer genes. So that's actually a main conclusion from this analysis. Now, those are all about uh, uh, other people of what can I do with this? It turns out this control theory, structure control theory analysis on my, my network aging analysis are basically the same graph approach. Right, so the control theory basically study the driver nodes and not a, a non-driver node. It turns out that the links also can be in this uh, uh, oh I see. They actually have three type of nodes. Uh, the, so in dispensable node basically means that node cannot be removed from the network. If it's not only the removed, the system is self controlled. And dispensable node basically means like your, your car, if you remove your windshield, your car is still travelable, even though it's not outside, but it, your, your windshield is not essential. So that's a dispensable component in your car. But so, so there are many genes that are also dispensable for control from the controllability point of view. And then there are some mutual ones. Like uh, my my time <laughs> uh, try to rush the through. So it turns out I basically can combine these two theory. I, but what can I do combine control theory with my network aging theory? So if if I want to apply the controllability plus my network in human, I need to know what genes are essential, what genes are not essential. And I cannot do experiment in human. That becomes a problem. It turns out that problem has been solved by these two persons, uh, Fun Zhang from Harvard and James Gardner from Berkeley. And in fact, the recent news, if you haven't read it, you should really know this. This is a really big deal because this is technology can change everything in any cell. In actually, when we, so, so we actually can know which gene are essential in human. That basically means my theory, I don't have, if I started today, I don't have to start with each cell anymore. I, I started my each book almost 10 years ago. But if I started today, I can just study human cells directly. That's basically what this means. I can apply controllability and network aging in human cells. Uh, in fact, um, people have uh, even tried, tried to even use the, this technology to change genes in human cells, they are all animal cells. See how it affect uh, gene network and treat diseases. So, and this, I didn't even check with this, this news report is true or not. So, so using uh, gene editing to, to treat disease is not that far away, but how to predict what effect will be are actually not even there. That becomes a, it's not, I'm, I'm going to drive to some place, I don't know the road. I think it's just dry, <laughs> right? So that's become a simply bit precarious way to, to, to conduct the correlation management. Okay, so and my whole idea is what can control theory of network engineering? Basically, it's going to analyze what are the best genes will be driver for one theory. That's, that's the whole process of, of this one. And 
I'll say that's one step closer to finding our new tower. Some people actually try to look for it at Florida, but I don't think that's a Florida. We call that a team network. So and we should look for a team network to look this functional new. So I think I'm right on time. So okay. And so uh, I actually I'm going to announce this actually the whole main point I <laughs> do. So and actually in the fall I'm going to uh, teach a computer science class biology elective course. I also cross this with a, a graduate level course. Um, I'm not even sure about the title yet, but the title is called computational technology. It's basically going to work through some of the problems I missed in there, or the data I have. So it's going to be a project based course, and, and the student basically going to learn you some computational tool to analyze genome scale data using necessary analysis. If, if, basically, I'm, I'm not even sure some of the problem, what kind of method it's going to be. Right, so, but if there's a problem needs you to do neural network, you, you, you have to use neural network to address that problem. So, so basically the, the methods are kind of easily do that, do that as possible method. You have to be determined by the problem. But the potential problem will be something I'm familiar with, like gene network and ice chain, expression of contact data like that point guide, that we and sequence data analysis. And maybe you can get your hands on some real raw data and can, can you actually uh, identify the genotypic difference in some individuals. People even put their genome sequence data online. There, there's a lot of people do that. And you can <laughs> analyze those people's data and see uh, whether there's a correlation between people's genome and lip code. I mean, the data is there, you can do an analysis, right? So, yeah. so uh, and we can also do RNA-C, a faster inference, on to cancer drug response and control ability of uh, gene. Right, so the whole idea of treating cancer is we give you some treatment kind of cancer cells to a way out and then have to fail uh, to like now. So you actually can do that analysis now. So and those basically kind of my advertisement on my course. <laughs> so, yeah.